JK, are you going to do your Trump impression? We're going to do your, your Trump. Okay. Yeah. Everybody, I'm getting my Twitter handle back Don't give him derangement week. syndrome right before we start the pod. I want to warm you him up. Ted Cruz. This doesn't warm him up. It gets him deranged. Get your show notes up, bitches. Let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sack. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another All In Podcast. With me today, of course, the dictator, Chamath Palihapitiya, the queen of quinoa, David Friedberg, and of course, yeah, definitely the rain man is here, David Sachs, who's an excellent driver in the driveway. Yeah. Okay, boys. Uh, I guess your, we made it to episode intro, 22. Your intro becomes one second longer for every episode we do. It's just <laughs> so- People love it. And people- so laborious, actually. Love it. You know, they don't. <laughs> they think it's so stupid. I you s- am- You have to understand persuasion. What I'm doing is I do the same intro and it warms oh, okay, people see, up to the Oh, okay. See, we're still we're still talking about the intro. Okay, let's just- <laughs> you're, I, I, See, everybody's obsessed about it. You proved my point. All right, guys. Are we going to dress? Elephant in the room. The elephant, elephant in the, the room, room, or do we just move on to topics? I will say... Elephant in the room. After the last show, um, I fought very hard with the three of you to not post that episode. You wanted to can't. You wanted to spike the episode. I wanted to spike the episode, and I'll tell you why. Um, I thought it was not good content. I don't think Vlad said anything new or remarkable or interesting. I don't think we had good analysis, and I think the whole thing kind of felt flat and felt like a PR stunt. And I felt that truly and honestly, and I, you know, I made the case to you guys that we should cancel. Um, obviously, I lost, uh, okay. and I think going forward we should have a veto right. But you know, we can talk about that offline. Did you quit the show, or did you threaten to quit the show? I threatened and to are quit you the quitting show. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna after this. I'm gonna propose to you my rules, my ground rules for for going forward. <laughs> One of which I think should be no more PR bullshit from Jason's portfolio. <laughs> but um, you know, besides that, I think I oh, might. Wait, be able I to think link- I hear a bestie guestie. Is that com.com at the door? <laughs> 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 and I, I don't think that we're Have journalists. And I, I, by the today? way, I, I don't, I don't think that the journalism thing works for us. I think we're like analysts and commentators, and you know, we have opinions. And so to bring someone on and try and interview them with a four-on-one format, it just feels weird. It doesn't seem to work. It doesn't create an opportunity for discourse. And frankly, you know. Um, when you try and do journalism in this context, you either appear like you're softballing or you appear like you're doing gotcha journalism. And I think both are bad. And so I think it works really well when the four of us just kind of chat and analyze and and shoot the shit and have opinions and talk and debate. Um, And so my vote is to kind of avoid doing bestie guesties unless, you know, it's something pretty amazing and critical and we can all kind of build a dialogue with that person around a topic but um, yeah, so that's kind of my, where, where I'm sitting and, and how I feel about it. But we've had a lot of debates, obviously, since uh, since the last episode about it. Can can I can I build on what you're saying? Um, you know, it, this is like kind of like that really uh, famous Teddy Roosevelt quote about sort of like the man in the arena with the dust on his face, right? Um, I feel like all four of us are in the grind doing things. And I think what makes the podcast good is it's almost like there's like, you know, in a basketball game of four quarters, there's a timeout and you come off the floor and you can actually just take a second to observe what you're seeing. And then the ref blows the whistle and you go back into the game. And I think for me, what makes this thing so fun is I feel like every Friday for these two hours, you know, it's basically the ref calls a timeout or the coach calls a timeout and we can just kind of take a breath and just observe, all right, what's happened? before we get back in the arena. And so, you know, just to your point, um, I don't think we're journalists and I don't think we should try to be because I don't think that's the point of what this is. It should be four friends talking about things that are important and then to the extent that it's important and interesting for other people, they'll listen or not listen. And I think these last few weeks, we got caught up a little too much in, you know, ratings, where is it ranking? How can we go higher? And it's that the gamification of people's reactions that I think caused us, you know, to do that. Um, whereas the episode before, I actually kind of liked because Draymond is legitimately one of our really good friends. You know, we He's see a bestie. him. We see him, we see him many, many times, obviously less during basketball season, but a ton when he's outside. We play poker together, we all hang out together. So it's that to me, I think, is sort of inbounds. Um, last week, and then also 
you know, last week, I, I think we were all supposed to be on point. I'll just tell you personally, for me, I had an extremely crushing two weeks of work. I was extremely tired. Um, I ended up literally unplugging and not doing anything for three days straight and sleeping. Um, and so it, I didn't even do my best even just to be either supportive or, you know, uh, argumentative with Vlad. So I don't think I got anything out of it myself. Okay, coming around the horn, Sax, do you, how do you feel that episode stands on its own? Obviously, it's very polarizing. We got barbecued in the comments. We got barbecued on Reddit. We got barbecued on social media. But then there were a large number of people who said they really liked it. Uh, my mom... Uh, <laughs> Jack Robin Hood, <laughs> David <Robin Hood>, PR, <laughs> my yeah. portfolio Robin manager. PR. Right. I mean, there Sequoia, were people who liked it. Sequoia thought it was yeah. excellent. Right. <laughs> There's 12 people in the yeah. lunch. Pun. Sachs, I, give I, us your I, candid I, assessment because you weren't as hard as these other two on it. Yeah, I wasn't as hard as these other two. And I do feel like that if they felt they that we were soft on Vlad, then they should have brought it harder. And they should have gone after v Vlad and challenged him more. That being said, I completely uh, understand and agree with what Freeberg is saying that, look, we're not journalists. We're not playing a game of gotcha. It's not our job to go after Vlad. Um, I think a lot of the, you know, the, the comments on Twitter, that's what they wanted us to do, but that's not who we are, you know? Um, well, it's difficult for business too, Sax. I mean, if you're attacking Vlad, and then the next day, we have to go into supporting founder mode. It's kind of a bad look, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's not what we do, right? right. I mean, we, we, we are, like Jamal was saying, we are in the arena. We're doing things. We're not critics sitting on the sidelines pointing out, you know, what the doers of deeds did wrong, you know? And so, it's not our job to, you know, run an inquisition on, on Vlad, you know? And so, we're not really equipped to do that. I think, I think, Freeberg is right that it doesn't really make sense to have guests on the show if the job is to, you know, to get to the bottom of something as investigators. You know, we're not yeah. we're not investigators. And it was, you know, a big story. Uh, and just to sort of put a cap in it, from my perspective, you know, I, I'm always supportive of my guys. I try to be supportive of whoever I invest in, and I try to give them the benefit of the doubt. And this is a situation where, you know, people are upset. There were mistakes that were made, and so. I think anything other than demolishing Vlad is considered by some constituency as a failure, right? And, and so what are we supposed totally. to do here? I can't be trashing my own company that I'm an investor in and a supporter of and, and founders who I believe in. It just that well, wouldn't be I authentic think there, there either. There was a moment there was a moment in the pod, Jason, where I think actually uh the, so on the whole, I thought Vlad did a did a good job in accomplishing his objective on our pod, which was the same objective he had in front of Congress, which was basically to run out the clock without saying very much, you know, and, uh, you know, he, he actually, whoever prepped him for, for Congress did a pretty good job because he testified for five hours and said nothing quotable, you know, which, which is pr pretty much kind the of the goal, can do right? in that yeah. situation. It's kind of the goal for, for Keep him. Keep your head down. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but there was a moment in the pod last week where I think Vlad got himself in a little bit of trouble. Freeberg did ask actually a pretty tough question about the guy in the street who who had lost all of his life savings. How would Vlad respond to that? He made this claim, well, I saved that person money because I shut down trading at the high. And, and then we pointed out, no, I mean, it, it, it was the high because you shut down trading. You have the causation backwards. And then you you ran in and said, whoa, 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 you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, my guy was on the floor. I got to pick him up. I, I, what are you talking about? I called a timeout. I got in there. But let's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Let's move Do on. we talk about the insanely high profile guest that was planned for March 5th that just yeah. canceled on us? No, no, no. We should. We should talk. Do about we put that it on too. the table? Because I, you know, I, this, this, the other thing about protocol, I'll just say Freeberg is if we have a guest on, you cannot just spike the guest if they took the time to be on that was my yeah, unless you tell them before they come on i may that spike, we might you spike you if it if it doesn't go there if we way. don't like it yeah i think do they get I that think, right none of us do this for a profession none of us are getting paid but to podcast get right we don't have any right? advertisers like i completely agree we're not here See, to be I a pr agree. machine for people i mean vlad had his freaking pr woman sitting on the zoom call while we were doing it last week you know i like i just don't think that's that a little that inside baseball that got interesting i think explain what happened when well, no, we don't need to go there, out. Jason. I just think I just think what Freeberg says is right. Like we we do this, we don't make any money from it. We do it because we like to talk. We I think we all learn from it. I think other folks enjoy it. They learn from it. But I do think that Freeberg's right. We're not going to be used as a shill. 
I think we're no, learning think as we this be. goes. I think we're we're learning what the ground rules should be, just like any other business. Vlad's made mistakes, he's gonna change. We've made some mistakes and we're iterating. And I think one positive iteration that Freeberg has proposed is if any one of us don't like an episode because we think it's basically moving away from our values, we should be able to spike it. And I I support that. I support it generally, but I don't like the idea of inviting a guest on and then it doesn't go well. And then telling, you know, from our perspective, it makes us look bad. And then we tell the guest, well, you came no, out think, good and we came out Freeberg, down, therefore we're killing no, your appearance. No, no, no. I, I don't think that's the point. I think what Freeberg says is like, look, this is not for to be a marketing thing. And so right. we're going to ask things that are exposed, that are about having a real conversation where there's sure. real honesty. And if you're going to just be there and bat around, as Sack said, to run the clock out, then we're just going to spike right, it. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think if that's communicated ahead, I'm okay By with By the it. way, come with your A game. And this is a great segue to talk about what actually we were a person that was going to come on and realize that they probably were going to get so pilloried um, that they basically spiked themselves uh, is- Yeah, they opted out. Chesa Boudin, the, the district attorney of San Francisco. Tell tell the guys what happened, Sex. Well, no, we we invited him to come on the podcast. No, no, we didn't invite to him us. to come. He, an intermediary, said that she could get him on the pod. Would we like to have him on the pod? We said we discussed it. We said sure, have Chester Boudin on, and then go from there. Sex. We didn't like seek him out. He was well, okay, back channel to us. So he he agreed. Great. So he but he agreed to be on the show, and then yes. you, our scheduler, got an email out of the blue like a day or two ago saying, "Sorry, he's not coming on the show." No explanation, right? Isn't that what happened? Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, so look, here's what I would say is, um, Chesa, Mr. District Attorney, you don't have to come on the show, but I will challenge you to a debate anytime, any place, any format on your policies in San Francisco. So if you have, if you have the huevos to engage in a debate, I am ready. And I thought Chase was a guy who had a little bit of courage. I mean, there was that night when people were discussing the situation in San Francisco and on Clubhouse, and he jumped into the room. So I thought this was a guy who had some cojones. So Chase, if you have, if you have the chutzpah, if you have the cojones, if you have the huevos, let's debate. Let's, let's debate. talk about your policies. For San and by the way, he's an expert. This is what he does. You know, for a he's living, an expert. isn't he a defense attorney? Sachs, you're going to have a. He was a public defender. He should he should mop the floor with me. I'm just some shallow Shlum. tech bro. Yeah, tech bro, tech bro. who doesn't know anything. Who he can easily demonize. So you're I would like say, come on, let's go. Plane. Let's do a debate. I'll agree to whatever format you want, but we need to talk about what's happening in San Francisco because crime is out of control, and it's his fault. Trigger the young Spielberg Rain Man song right about. Here we go. <laughs> Drop it. Boom. Baby, I'm the Rain Man. <laughs> With me cackling in should, behind. Should we, I'm like should we talk hype about man. it? Let's talk about it. I, we should talk about what's happening in San Francisco. Okay. So since since the last pod, there there has been another victim, um, Sharia Mas Masyoka, who was a, a young a uh, young man from from originally from Kenya who he came to the United States for college, just like Hannah Abe, uh, who, who was killed on New Year's Eve. Uh, he went to Dartmouth. All of his advisors said he was brilliant. He had a young wife and a three-year-old baby. He was in San Francisco for 10 days, goes out running and gets hit, gets gets killed by another drugged out hit and run driver who had been uh, named, um, uh, let's see, I think it was uh, Jerry... Jerry Oli Adams or something like that. Um, I don't have the, the the guy's name, but he was arrested four or five times in the last year, and he was released every single time by Budin's office. It's it's just like the New Year's Eve story, where you had this repeat offender, Troy McAllister, hit. You know, he was he had stolen a, a car. He was fleeing another crime he had committed. He was on drugs, and he killed Hannah Abe and Elizabeth Platt. And this was, this was another case where he was caught five times over the past year. And every single time he was not charged by Boot and he was just let go. And so we have this case. We have a, a district attorney who doesn't want to prosecute people. His agenda is decarceration. It's like a fire chief who doesn't believe in using water. Yes. And, and Bur he, he is part of the burn it all down party. Let me challenge you with the argument he might make, which I think I've heard him make a few times. Um, 
which is really um, uh, a position on the criminal justice system, not necessarily on local prosecution. But really, what he says is, once um, you know, once someone ends up in the criminal justice system in the United States, it causes this cycle of recurrence and the cycle of repeat that is very difficult to get out. It, it basically minimizes the opportunity for reform uh, for an individual, uh, for a criminal to, to reform themselves and to have a shot at being a successful member of society again in the future. And the objective is find other ways to, to, to kind of um, accelerate reform and not use incarceration as the only tool in the toolbox. What is, um, you know, what is the, the argument back to him when he makes that point? Because I've heard him make that point a number of times. And how do you kind of move past that, uh, that point with him? Yeah. So, so the, 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 I'm not saying that incarceration is the only answer, but Budin's only answer is decarceration. He doesn't want to prosecute anyone. He doesn't want to lock anybody up. And we see the results immediately in this community. You have these repeat offenders now killing people. They should have been locked up. Um, it's, you know, Budin's always putting forth these elaborate theories. This is, you know, the, the Central Chronicle Chronicle, an article about it, about why these crimes occur. And he never wants to put the fault on the people who are actually perpetrating the crimes. It's always economic desperation. He just put it forward a, a theory that a decline in tourism is causing, uh, people to commit more uh, home invasions. What? You know, he, he never wants to, yes, this was in the uh, San Francisco Chronicle article here. I'll pull so, it up on the I mean, on it's crazy. Screen. I mean, the other thing you left out, David, I'll say is, and this was really, you know, hits home to anybody with kids, is a food driver for DoorDash, uh, not that it matters which service, but uh, was in San Francisco's Pacific Heights neighborhood, which is the safest and most elite neighborhood uh, in, it's, you know, the Beverly Hills or Bel Air of San Francisco. Um, and his car was carjacked with his four-year-old daughter and two-year-old boy inside. Now, of course, you should not be leaving two kids in the car. Putting that aside, that mistake, which I'm sure this father is suffering over, but he needed to make deliveries, obviously. He made a mistake of leaving the kids in the car. But the, we all got an Amber Alert last week on our phones. I mean, this is the law, level of lawlessness. It's turned into Escape from New York level right. gotham city right. level chaos so here and the criminals know they will not be prosecuted and this is the key criminal justice problem here if you say you are not going to prosecute crime and you demonstrate to the hardest core faction of criminals that you don't prosecute they're going to take advantage of that weakness and and that's what's yeah. happening let me take the counterpoint just for a second just so we can construct what the other side of the argument looks like the other side of the argument says okay these folks are largely, you know, engaged in an enormous amount of petty crime to support their drug habit, right? I think that's probably the, and that, you know, underneath that is just an explosion uh, of opioids and fentanyl and whatnot. Underneath that is sort of economic uncertainty that's been compounding and just basically cresting over. Um, and so folks would say, okay, these guys are a victim of a much broader economic malaise that needs to get fixed. I'm just, I'm just, you know, you're shaking yeah. your head, Jason, but I'm just saying, I think that that's where the trail of breadcrumbs grows in the counter, in the counter, in the, in, in the counter argument. So, well, the, 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 these are, these are the types of arguments that Chasa makes in order to um, obfuscate and disguise that his real agenda is basically radical decarceration. You know, he's got this, this childhood background where his parents went to jail when he was just a baby and he grew up. He says his earliest memories are visiting his parents in jail and it profoundly affected his political views. And now we I have to he, suffer through this. We're suffering for- <laughs> Through his for childhood the, trauma. Through his childhood trauma. And so, so Tramath, you're right about deeper causes, but it doesn't excuse the need to lock people up when they are dangerous to the community. And it's not just petty crime. I mean, let's, let's go through the, the actions he's taken as DA. Okay. So first week on the job, just about, he abolished the whole cash bail system. Okay. Which voters in November just voted uh, in, with uh, Prop 25 to affirm. So voters of California want the cash bail system because it keeps criminals locked up. What Chase has said is that he would replace cash bail with an algorithm. Well, what exactly is that algorithm? He won't explain. Well, he won't submit to third party audit. There is no algorithm. They're just letting people go. Okay. Then the next thing he did was fire seven veteran prosecutors in the DA's office 
who weren't on board with his agenda. These are people who have spent their whole lives prosecuting murders, rapes, I mean, hardcore crime. And it takes years of experience to learn how to be a prosecutor like that. So for him to just purge this office of these veteran prosecutors is a disaster for the city. I've been talking to people who used to work in the DA's office, and they tell me that the problem goes much deeper than that, that in addition to these seven veterans he purged, over 30 prosecutors, which is about a quarter of the whole office, have left under his reign because they don't like working for him. So, he, you know, and he complains about being short-staffed. He says a lot that he can't, you know, prosecute everyone he needs to prosecute because he's so short-staffed. The reason he's short-staffed is no one wants to work for him, you know? By the way, I think it's worth highlighting, mm -hmm. this guy was elected, right? So the the, the city, uh, the voters in the city- In a runoff, I understand, right? He, he won by something like 2,000 votes. It was a tiny, tiny number of votes. Regardless, I, pe people voted him in on a platform that he very clearly articulated and is now realizing in office. So- there was something about that platform that I think is worth noting was and is appealing uh, and and probably is to a large number of people. Large in San number. Right. Yeah. And no, the, 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 the part of it that's appealing, OK, is that is that is that we, we do believe that there are too many people in prison and that a better and a better way to deal with a drug addict who commits, say, petty theft is to send them to treatment. OK, as opposed to putting them in prison. Right. So, so I think we can all agree on that. But but his agenda is so much more radical than that. He just doesn't want to lock people up. Take um take Troy McAllister, okay? This is a dangerous person who uh he was uh, he was facing trial for his third strike, okay? He committed armed robbery. He robbed a store with a gun, okay? He, he was facing a third strike for that for that robbery. And one of the first things uh, Chase did when he came in was basically uh, release him for time served. He basically pleaded that down. That was someone who's facing a life sentence. That is the reason why Hannah Abe and Elizabeth Platt are dead is because he didn't want to prosecute. That's a violent offender. Sex, I, I, I'm not disagreeing, by the way. I think like w what is interesting to me is that so many people um, have an eye on and agree with the notion that criminal justice system needs reform. The problem is realizing that reform with a radical district attorney doesn't really resolve to a solution. It resolves to more problems on a local level. Here's what's and, and, and even Chesa said this publicly, which is like, you can't just solve this problem from the DA's office. It is a much bigger and broader problem. And the radical action he's taking isn't solving any problems. It's creating far more. And um, I think it is worth noting, though, that there is, should, and likely will be, especially with uh, Kamala Harris, uh, um, as vice president, uh, some attempts at reforming on a federal level, um, uh, you know, how, how, how criminals are treated, how the system um, realizes opportunities for them to reform and, and come back into society uh, as productive members. But I mean, to your point, you lose all sense of safety and security if you try and do it solely on the local level. Well, let me let me ask a question. Like, look, now we have basically political activism and judicial activism on not just the right, right? People used to pillory Trump for putting in all these, you know, extremely conservative judges who felt they were going to just sort of like legislate their own point of view, um, you know, Supreme Court nominees who were going to try to overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, but it turns out it's happening on the left as well, I guess, just more at the local level. Um, how pervasive is this? Like, meaning the issues of San Francisco, are these, are these the same issues of other cities and towns in yeah. America? Well, I mean, you've got Gascon in LA who's running the exact same agenda as Chase Boudin. He's not prosecuting third strikes. He was just sued by a, an organization of deputy DAs and the judge is now requiring him to uphold the law, which is three strikes. He will not bring third strike charges on his own. He's also, this is both Gascon and Boudin now have prohibited prosecutors from attending the parole hearings of dangerous convicts murderers, rapists, whatever. And victims groups are up in arms because they need a prosecutor to go there and explain to the parole board why this person does not deserve to be released. And so you now have recall movements forming. And by the way, they've also done stuff like take death penalty off the table. They've take, taken gang enhancements off the table. They're like voluntarily, they're unilaterally disarming their, 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 their prosecution teams. They're taking away weapons at their disposal to lock people up. And this is why you're already seeing Recalls forming around Gascon in LA. There's now a recall of uh, Budin forming okay, in San David, Francisco. Okay, but David, David, go back to what Freeberg just said. They're probably not doing a bait and switch on their platform. So let's just like, 
What do you think it is about what they are saying that resonates on the way in f- with a plurality right. of people? Yeah. Here, here's the thing that resonates. Um, and, and, and it's not that, it, again, it goes back to this idea that in- incarceration is definitely not the only answer. This is where I agree. The problem is Budin is on the other side of it where decarceration is his only answer, right? We need to use uh, multiple weapons or tools in our toolkit here. So, so hold on. So for, for example, okay, let's take the, let's take the drug addict who commits a petty, petty theft. We all agree that person should go to treatment, not to jail or prison, right? A nonviolent of course. offender. Okay. Reasonable. But how are you, how are you going to get that person to go to treatment? Because right now there is no leverage whatsoever to get that person to go to treatment because Boone's just not bringing charges. He's not prosecuting. The choice should be given to that person. Listen, you can either go to jail or you can go to treatment. Yeah, Which, what's stick. it going to be? Yeah. That's right. Right now, th- we have all these social services. Guess what? Nobody uses them because a hardcore addict is not going to avail themselves of those services. I-, I would make the argument that we have a broader, bigger problem with the criminal justice system as it operates. And it is deep and it is complex and it is friggin' awful. There's a book from a few years ago um, that this guy named Shane Bauer wrote. Um, I'm just trying to remember the name. I think it's called American Prison. And uh, the guy goes undercover and he goes and works in a, in a, in a, in a penitentiary in Louisiana. Um, and he reports on what the conditions are like. And these are these, these prisons that are run by private companies that are contracted by the state locally. We and what that. it's like to be an employee at one of these companies and what these employees do and how the prisoners are treated. There is no system for reform once you end up behind bars in most prisons in the United States. And that is, um, you know, he makes the argument, others have made the argument that is a, uh, has a long history that dates all the way back to slavery in the United States. And in some cases, it's just about ineptitude. And in some cases, it's about unions, especially in California, where we have a, a huge cost for uh, for corrections and for the, uh, the health care and the pensions for corrections officers. Um, and so there's a lot of complex competing interests in history that relates to why this criminal justice system doesn't largely work on a moral and ethical basis, as we might all kind of, you know, wear our hearts and look at like at how things are working. And so the problem is everyone sees this, or a lot of people will see this, voters will see this system, treating people poorly, being inept, being corrupt, being and they want to f- being racist, and they want to fix yeah. it. And the way they fix it is they see a guy who shows up and he's like, I'm a sledgehammer, and I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to take care of all these people. And the reality is when you try and take a shotgun and shoot it inside of a room, it's going to cause more problems than good. And I think that's really what he is. He is a manifestation well of the said. anger of voters and the anger of people that look at Can how I, complex and racist the system is and how difficult it is to resolve these problems. And we're all I, looking for a simple big hammer answer. And he's got the biggest mouth around and the biggest hammer. And, that, and, that, and that's why people vote for him. All right, Chamath, and then we'll wrap it in. Absent a few uh, words, specifically racist, if you took that out, you could use that entire statement you said and describe Trump as well. Meaning the left and the right are moving to these polls where it's all about authoritarian sort of strongmen at the federal, state, local level, folks, to your point, David, that just want to go and take a sledgehammer to things. And depending on your political beliefs or depending on the biases or depending on your life lived, you're going to gravitate to these two polls. And what's crazy is over the next 20 or 30 years, these polarizing figures will become crisper, sharper, smarter. You know, they'll find a way to foment all of su- all of the support without any of the long tail shittiness that Trump figured out. Like Trump was, you know, he's like a beta test of an idea, right? He was like version 0.1. Wait till we see version 1.0 of the American strongman or strongwoman. It's really going to be fucking scary. Well, yeah, I mean, and this is this is a guy who um, uh, w- was a fan of of Hugo Chavez long after he revealed himself to be a strongman intent on ruling for life. And so, yeah, he is very much in that mold. He is a sledgehammer to the system. But but look, I think and and the problems are big and complicated. But look, we all have a role to play. The reformers have a role to play. Public defenders and defense attorneys have a role to play. And the district attorneys and prosecutors have a role to play. And the problem we have right now and, and the role of the district attorney is to prosecute. Okay? I don't think that this, by the way, Sachs, is a very difficult problem to solve. I think there are just so many misaligned incentives. It's very clear that we don't try to reform 
people when they go to prison and that there's a weird incentive when it's a for-profit prison and the customers and the revenue is based on how many people you have in the prison. So if we just get rid of that, there's no private prisons where people have an incentive to keep people in there. And then if we made treatment free for everybody and had overcapacity of treatment centers, and then we look at the drug schedule and say, these are the drugs that are not, these are the drugs that are not harmful. And these are the drugs that are really, really, really harmful. We're looking at a fentanyl issue, like it's a cannabis issue, and that that's drugs. You know, cannabis versus fentanyl is like a nuclear bomb versus like a slingshot. It, sure. There's no comparison sure, Jason, between these two things. Gonna, right. And, and, but here's the thing. No one's going to treatment when they're not forced to. Well, of course, right? But there's no treatment to go to. Maybe David. the maybe. wait for treatment is six no, weeks, no, eight that's weeks, not true. 12 that's weeks. Not true. In a lot that's of places. That's not true. We, we, we have a lot of social services that aren't being used. There are There is a lot of treatment available. People don't want to do it unless they really have to. Let me bring it back to where we were before. Maybe the right thing is to actually have a bunch of these sledgehammer folks go off for the next 10 or 20 years, you know, the Trumps and the Chesa Boudins, maybe they're all the same. And maybe what we're all just saying is enough's enough. This system doesn't work. So let's just tear it down. Every single brick of it, brick by brick at the local, state and it's federal chaos. level. All, all, all I'm saying is um, just, I just want to get your reaction to that statement, guys. Maybe, maybe that's what well, we're seeing. Well, people are, that, that is what Boudin is doing is he is deconstructing the district attorney's office from the inside. He is destroying it. He is not bringing charges against people. He's driving away all the veteran prosecutors. No, but to, he's bring, to Chamath's he's bringing point, in, Sachs. He's bringing in all his, he's bringing in his, in his own people who all were uh, public defenders and have that mindset. And people are dying. Look, we can see the results right now in the streets. Innocent people are dying. Hannah Abe, Elizabeth Platt, Sharia. No, it's Muscaria. an emergency. But to Chamath's point, is there any validity, Sachs or Friedberg, to the burn it all down, cause chaos, and then people come in and say, you know what? That's not going to... This that's needs not to be fixed. Let's have a nuanced no, we, discussion. We Will to, nuanced need, be added to this discussion, Sachs or Friedberg? We, we need to improve things incrementally, okay? You're not going to make things better by dismantling the whole district attorney's office. I mean, come on. We need to improve things incrementally. Yeah. I mean, look, everything looks exponential until it cycles back. So, you know, you're only going to have so much um, evolution to Gotham in San Francisco until enough people put their hands in the air and say, okay, you know, time for a change. Let's go back and let's start fixing this. They are. They are saying that. That's why we're having... Th that's I mean, there's a recall Chesa Budin movement. Flexing a muscle and making yeah. it stronger. I think, you know, we're learning a lot about what approaches to criminal justice reform work and what approaches do not work. And it is clear that a local only non-prosecution position is not going to work with respect to both criminal justice reform and the satisfaction of the society at large. Um, and we're realizing I, I, that. And I think we, we are inevitably, I mean, there's so many people that are up in arms. We are inevitably going to cycle yes. back the other way at some point very soon here. Yeah. And honestly, I think you guys are over intellectualizing this a little bit. You know, when, when Sharia uh, died because he got hit by, by that repeat offender, they asked his uh, wife, who's responsible for this? She said very clearly, the DA, that is who's responsible. And she's right. Let's stop over intellectualizing this. I know the problems are big and complicated. Frankly, people like Chesa prey on that because they can kind of obscure what they're doing with, you know, some nice sounding obfuscation, some nice sounding words but the reality is he's not prosecuting the way he needs to we got to stop this yeah and, and you, it is possible to have nuance and to hold multiple ideas in your head at the same time david you can there's a practical reality to people cannot murder people people cannot drive in cars and run red lights on fentanyl while saying the criminal justice system is incredibly biased and racist and people who are of color in Texas, you know, wind up in jail for five or 10 years for selling a bag of weed. And then we're investing in companies that are making weed gummies or people are buying stock in weed companies at the same time. You can't have one person who's a black teenager in Texas going to jail for decades for doing what somebody in California or Seattle or Canada is getting an IPO for. I mean, this is a fundamental injustice in the world. And you're right, that's something that Chesa preys on. But there must be nuance here where we look at each individual situation and say, what are the ways to solve the problem surgically, not with a shotgun to David Freeberg's point, but with maybe a scalpel and a, and a sniper rifle? Do we want to move on to questions from our audience because they submitted hundreds of questions? Or do we want to move on to the Australia news 
and Facebook backing out of publishing news if it's a good end, thing or a bad thing. Let's end with the Q&A, I think. Sachs, what the fuck is going on with Facebook and Australia and climate change? And this is insanity. Yeah. So I think what's going on in Aust- Australia is, is contemplating a law that would require Facebook and Google, and I think just those two companies, to essentially pay royalties for hyperlinks to, 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 to news publications. And I think this is mostly at the behest of some powerful uh, newspaper magnates down there. I think like Rupert Murdoch and I love the way like you that. say magnates. It's like well, they are. I mean, you know, um, and so, uh, it, but 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 this issue is, is going to be very closely watched by Europe and maybe even the U.S. Um, it's basically a tra- uh, like a a wealth transfer from Google and and Facebook to the traditional media and to traditional publishers. Um, this is an issue where I actually um, side with with Zuckerberg and Facebook on this. I mean, I kind of throw up a little bit in my mouth saying that, but um, uh, but uh, no. But look, it, Tim Berners Lee has come out and said that it, it could really interfere with the open internet and the World Wide Web if you start to tax hyperlinks. I mean, historically, hyperlinks and t- the titles on hyperlinks were. Um, were, 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 were fair use. You could, you could use those things without violating somebody else's copyright or need to pay them a royalty. And so I think that it's, it's bizarre to me that, that Facebook and, and Google wouldn't now be able to use hyperlinks. And I'm kind of worried about where that goes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, so well, Facebook, so, yeah. Facebook said that they're not going to publish links now for Australian news. And then, but then they followed that up with they were also going to start. Uh, dismantling any anti-climate change content. I don't know if that's just just in Australia. Well, there's labeling. So there's another thing going on, which is they've decided now to label any posts involving climate change, which is part of the whole censorship debate. And um, and so separate yeah, issue. I mean, well, it's separate but related in the sense that the traditional media is cheering on censorship, but then when Facebook essentially uh, censors these links because they don't want to pay royalties to the traditional media. Then the traditional media is up in arms, and so they're very selective in how they how they view these issues. My, my principle is very consistent, which is I want an open internet. I'm against censorship in all of its forms, and I and I you know and I'm I'm worried that this new Australian law could really lead to some lead to an overall re- reduction or shutdown. Here's what's really I think going on is that. With fair use, the doctrine of fair use, it's a four-part test. Uh, You're a lawyer, obviously, you know all this, Sachs, but to sort of educate people in the audience who don't, there's no specific uh, number of characters, no specific percentage of the original work that you uh, can use you to clear yourself of fair use. Fair use is a test. When it goes before a judge, a judge looks at this four-part test, the percentage of the work you used, is the public confused? Um, is there some educational or criticism version of it? So if you were to use 10% of this podcast and you were to wrap it with, you know, put us in a picture window and you were 50% of it and there was no confusion that you were commenting on this, that would be fair use. Or if you were to use it in an educational system and if you were monetizing it. Now, if you were to just clip our podcast, like this one website clipped the podcast and made 60 clips of it, took our file, and I sent them a cease and desist actually and said, hey, don't do this. We're doing it ourselves. They fought us. And they said, we're fans. And I said, I don't care if you're fans or not. You're not linking back. You're not giving us credit. And you're doing 60 clips. If you want to do one or two clips and you want to comment on it, that's fine. But you can't take all 60 clips and make a 60 clip version of this. Um, and so fairness is in the word fair use. The problem with Zuckerberg and with how Google has used journalist content is they are clipping out specific sections of it and putting it in something called one box on Google. So many of you might have said, how many people, you know, how many pounds are in, you know, whatever, or what time is this TV show on? And then the content that was made by The Ringer or The New York Times gets clipped and they put just that section, David with an algorithm and they give you the answer. So you don't need to go visit that website. This is tipping over into what I would call unfair use because you're eliminating the person linking. Now, let me finish. Yeah. If it was just the URL and you didn't pull the headline, you didn't pull the abstract, and you didn't pull a photo, that would be fine. There is a very easy solution to this, which is if you want to pull the link and the headline, you pay $0. But if you want to pull anything else, 
100 characters, et cetera, you need to get a license from that person unless you are doing actual criticism. So there's nothing to stop anybody in Australia right now from taking a screenshot of a New York Times story or an Australian, you know, newspaper story and writing some commentary on it. You just can't wholesale take everything. And so what we're seeing here is a real time negotiation between private parties into what is fair. And I think Google has a really rich history of sharing revenue. Uh, the App Store, they give 70% to app developers. YouTube, they give 55% to creators. And with AdSense, they let you put AdSense on your website and they give you 68 cents on the dollar or something in that range. They never actually disclose the exact percentage, but that's what I'm told it is. Facebook has given $0 to Instagram users, $0 to WhatsApp users, $0 to Facebook folks. They're too greedy. And what Facebook needs to do is either not use the content or come up with some reasonable payment and come to an agreement with these folks who are now banding together. And they're realizing the traffic we get from Facebook and Google is not worth what they're taking away from with us, which is all that revenue that, you know, they earned in the free market. And so this is a free market debate. And I think the government should stay out of it to a certain extent, and let the free market work, which is all publishers should get together in the United States and confront Facebook and say, pay us unless you use anything more than the headline. But Jason, I think these things are interconnected though, right? On the one hand, if you if you have an economic stake in distribution of content, but then you're also then going to decide under, you know, a, an opaque definition what is truth or not truth, you all of a sudden just become, I mean, the purest form definition of a publisher. Right? And I think it just becomes a very treacherous place for both Facebook and Google to end up in. So it's almost well, Google's paying the bell, by the way. Yeah, no, you're right. Google's paying for it. Facebook has decided not to, but Facebook uh, they said something like only four percent of their 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 posts involve this kind of content. So it's just not a big deal for them the way it is for for Google. Well, I think and it I, is and, a big and, deal for Facebook. They're just trying to make a point here because Zuckerberg's a, yeah yeah, you know, and they're they're being they're hardcore. being. They're being overly heavy handed in their response. Yeah. There's no question about it. They're, they're throwing their weight around. It doesn't look good, but I'm not defending Facebook. I'm defending the principle. I mean, look, if this Australian principle were used, you wouldn't have the Drudge Report. You wouldn't be able to create a site yeah. of, of news links. No, you I could mean, if it was commentary. You could put the link not, and write Drudge commentary. Not, it's when you just rip the links. People are objecting to ripping the links report, without any commentary. Judge Report right. re rewrites the headline, puts his own spin on it, and then links. He would never get caught into this, and there is no publication that would ever object. What they're objecting to is taking the photo, taking the first paragraph, and the the the, the synapsis is 30 or 40% of the value. And so Facebook is a better, and Twitter is, with their algorithms are better front pages than the New York Times front page. Well, why isn't this applying to Twitter then? I, I think it will ultimately. They'll, they'll go there as well. Um, I think this will become the test case, which is if you want to take more than just the headline or, or, and like, you know, ba basically that's it, or the URL, if you want to have that little snippet, pay us. Pay us something. It doesn't have to be a lot. But this right. could actually solve if these networks that are making tens to hundreds of millions of billions of dollars, if they just said, you know what, 1% to the news organizations to keep them viable, just like anybody else would pay in a licensing fee for terrestrial why radio. Is it, well, why, is, why is the Australian government setting the price? And why are they only applying this to Google and Facebook? Well, th I think they're going to go right down the line. I think it's just a starting point. But to my point, I said earlier is I don't think the government needs to do this. Right. I think the news organizations en masse should get together yeah. and put their foot down and say no. And if well, they did, I mean, they would get it paid. Sounds, it sounds like what the government should do is clarify what fair use entails. Yeah, just and a then link. Maybe it's just a, maybe it's a link plus a title. I mean, look, it, it's it's never just a link, right? It's a hyperlink plus the, the like, snippet plus the word. Yeah, exactly. Yes, the so, snippet is so, the issue. Right. So. so fine. So the government should clarify what fair use is, and then if Google and Facebook or whoever want more, they got to go negotiate for it. Exactly. But but. Australia is doing more than that. They're setting the price and they're limiting their overreaching policy just to Google and Facebook because they know that if they applied it to everybody, By it would the way, break we the do that. We, we already do this in the United States, David, with local carriage of uh, news organizations on terrestrial TV. So we already have, we already mix it up with the FTC doing this with licenses and, and the public good. So it's the extent. I think the other thing that, you know, is going to happen with all of this is like on the other, on the other side of this. The actual media organizations themselves that theoretically could benefit from this are frankly just going out of business anyways. I, I, there's a, 
you know, there's a Wall Street Journal alert um, for the owner of the LA Times who's about to sell the Times. Like, it's very likely that the Times in four or five years doesn't even exist. So I don't really know where all of this goes, except that, you know, everybody's just going to be an individual person blogging and tweeting whatever opinion <laughs> they want, right? So there'll be no money to pay anybody because it won't really matter. But what will be left is then these rules on arbitration of fact and fiction. And I think that that's where we're going to end up. That's going to be a crazy place. Because then those folks, those folks then really are the puppet masters. Yeah, I, 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 I agree that these traditional publications have like a fundamental business model problem. And it's not going to be solved. Like, I think there's a, uh, like a misplaced blame on Facebook and, and Google. I mean, the fundamental problem with all these publications are you go search for a news article on something and there's like, 10 versions of the same thing or more, a hundred versions. And, you know, when, when newspapers, we used to have thousands of newspapers all across the country and they had a, a local geographic monopoly. But once it all got digitized and moved online, you realize how much redundancy there was. You have yep. thousands of reporters creating the exact same thing and there needs to be consolidation. It doesn't make sense to have a hundred articles. Not, not only that, but a point we made last time, which is, um, you know, facts have largely commoditized or most facts like, you know, remember, we used to open the newspaper and look at what the stock market prices were. We, we opened the newspaper and looked at the sports scores. We looked at what happened in this place and this place. Facts about events, facts about the prices of things, facts about sports scores. That's all completely commoditized. I mean, that's like 90% of the content of what people used to read the newspaper for has gone online. And so as we talked about last time, newspapers and publications of the like have largely moved into, you know, different sorts of narrative. And um, you know, it's created a, a marketplace that has a lot more competition because anyone can write that as we are, we're seeing with Substack and Medium and as we're seeing with our own podcast, as we're seeing with our own podcast. Yeah. And I think that's, um, this feels to me like, you know, I went to a media conference back in 2008 and there was this huge battle, uh, between Google and, um, Viacom and I, I was at the conference and I think Larry Page was on stage or someone or Eric Schmidt was on stage and the Viacom CEO got up and he's like, when are you going to start paying us for our content? And uh, I think that that, and he really screamed at him in a room of like 800 people. And I feel like that same kind of point of view has persisted until there's finally some legislation that they feel kind of gets them justice. Meanwhile, the world has passed them by. And, uh, you know, I think this, uh, this will be kind of some transitory uh, legislation that ultimately the content is going to democratize anyway, and the content creation is going to democratize. Last topic for me, because uh, I really want Friedberg's answer to this, because I also just saw an alert how the federal government is opening up a vaccination site in Miami-Dade County. I actually saw Francis Suarez retweet it. Um, what the hell is going on with vaccinations? Are we going to get vaccinated soon? <laughs> I said it in December, and I, I tweeted about it, and I've repeated it multiple times since, that the U.S., has enough supply to vaccinate pretty much anyone that wants to get vaccinated because we are producing and delivering three to four million doses per day in the US right now. And um, there is a just a fundamental issue, especially like, I mean, look at California, you know, they haven't opened up, quote unquote, vaccination to people outside of tier, what they call tier 1A. Um, and so this is much more of a kind of policy issue than uh, an administrative issue, um, than a supply and demand issue. There's enough people that want the vaccine, and there's enough vaccine. So just let people get fucking vaccinated. Um, and so I feel like the market forces are now kind of converging with policy a little bit more than they were a month ago. And the policymakers are no longer fighting and complaining about supply and complaining about constraints. You know, we've got mass vac sites now in California. The amount of money that's being wasted, by the way, in this process makes me want to vomit every time I read about it. That's a whole another separate issue. But it feels to me like we're probably May, June, when enough people are vaccinated that we can have, you know, a circumstance where people are going to fly without masks and be comfortable doing so. But I'm sure there will be these over, you know, constraining rules around what people can and can't do in public for a very long time. Like I mentioned what happened. I do want to say one thing that I've noticed. We, we were we were all we played some poker the other night and we were with a, a friend who uh, got vaccinated and I was like he said this is my first time playing poker with people and I was like well you got vaccinated like why aren't you he's like well I don't know if other strains are going to get me or you know if this thing's evolving and other people are going to get sick and um, if you think about what's happened over the last year people have been conditioned to be afraid and so even though we're getting vaccinated, even though this thing is moving and working, I'm concerned that we're not going to end up in a more civil state. Schools aren't opening. 
people aren't flying. People aren't doing stuff even after vaccinations and science and data shows Except that these in things are okay. Texas and Florida. And maybe there's some, there's open, some right? there's, maybe there's some cases of it. But I, I, what I'm saying is like, you know, the human subconscious gets trained first, and then our conscious mind rationalizes what we feel. We've all now been trained yeah. over the past year to be very afraid. And then we oh, all come man. up with these rational excuses about why I can't do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, but you've been fucking vaccinated. You're fine. Like all the data, all the science says, go do whatever you want to do. Go into a nightclub, sweaty, next to people, <laughs> throbbing beats Keep and going, music. Freeberg. Yes, and tell, us, tell us about the throbbing like, nightclub, yeah, it's like I've never seen you it, so animated. It's like that scene from Good Will Hunting. Remember when he talks to the psychology? He's like, tell us about your rave yeah. stories again. Activate the 90s fourth emotion. Fourth, yeah. Throbbing rave, give up to the mob, pulsating, throbbing music, bodies, and did the Molly just kick in, Friedberg? Did you drop a Molly at the start of the pod? <laughs> but my point is, like, people are really afraid, and I think uh, I just got the best idea for an episode. The biggest concern I have is, frankly, less about are we going to get vaccinated. I feel like the convergence right. between market forces and government nonsense is now going to allow us to all get you vaccinated. Guys, but uh, but the off, issue is really going to be like, how do you break through these rules and the fear that that basically become? I want, but I don't understand uh, where where are the max vaccination sites in California, and who's eligible? Like. Why aren't we just making this thing like a drive through? We should. Exactly. This is where we can absolutely They're popping up right, right now. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. You got I think we, we all have absolute violent agreement that California is so messed up with respect to how we're vaccinating. Mm -hmm. We have so much supply. We're sitting on half our friggin supply right now in California. There's 30 million there. vaccines sitting on shelves. We are now at 75% deployed, 80% California has got like four or 5 million vaccines sitting in storage. Right. It should be a drive through and you just get in line and you go. And in some places what we're is, doing yeah. is... In, you know, but in, in what we're doing now is you got to schedule an oh, appointment. Oh, yeah, scheduling's bullshit. Because you, first you got to qualify, then you got to schedule an appointment, and then the 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 clinic or whatever is only open from nine to five. And so, like, how many doses are they really administering when you got to make an appointment? Probably one every half hour. So maybe they get through sixteen people a day or and something, proof, something like proof that. Qualifications. Yeah, and they get fined a million dollars and lose their medical license if they inject the wrong person. So, I mean, you're talking about sixteen people per day at a site when they could be doing a couple of hundred. I mean, it's crazy. Well, Johnson & Johnson is coming, and that's refrigerator stable, right, Freeberg? So you don't even need we it. now we, have bought yeah, 1.2 billion vaccines. Yeah. But let me, let me go back to Freeberg's point about when will life get back to normal. I'm not as pessimistic as you are, Dave, about th this idea that life won't go back to normal. And part of the reason why is I'm seeing so much outrage about school closures right now. California is one of the only states in the country that still completely closed all the schools and people are absolutely up in arms. I'd say it's as big an issue as this exploding crime issue. Crime is a big issue in the cities and school closures is the big issue in the suburbs. And if these two things don't turn around, I think Gavin Newsom is going to get recalled. I mean, people are just on fire about this. Yeah. But I mean, my point was like our, our wealthy, conservative, you know, uh, friend that lives in Florida was afraid to go do stuff even after he's been vaccinated. Yeah, and I think that's I what's mean, permeated everywhere. It's just like, like there's, a shark, there's, Freeberg. Yeah. It's like a shark attack. You know, if there's a shark attack, you know, at Half Moon Bay or whatever, people don't swim there for a couple of weeks, and then somebody swims, and they're like, "Oh, the water's great." People will jump back in. I think it's April, David, to your point of when this goes back to normal. Because if you look now, people have been saying, Freeberg, correct me if I'm wrong. Would you put a 5x multiplier on the confirmed COVID cases, a 4x multiplier yeah, yeah, at this 5x, point? 5x, I think, is the right okay. medium, medium. So yeah. if you have 30 million people who've had the vaccine, uh, had COVID, you're looking at five times that is 150. Now you have 60 million people who have been vaccinated. We're at 210. There were 330 million Americans, 70 million are under our kids. So, you know, we're, we're basically getting to herd immunity. And if you look at the slopes right now, what is causing the drop in cases this massively, David? Is it herd immunity, vaccine, or are people suddenly wearing masks? What is it? There, there's complexity because everyone assumes that there's one thing that affects the whole population. But remember, the way viruses work is they're hyper-local. And so the local population dynamics looked at on a scale is where you see the statistical results of the scale. And so, you know, we saw this in North Dakota. A bunch of people got really sick. They got to herd immunity in communities, and then all of a sudden it dropped off the curve. When you zoom out and that's happening, combined with behavioral changes, combined with vaccines, then you start to see these statistical things happen at scale. So it's not a simple answer, but the answer generally can be we are coming down the slope. We are getting to a point of you know general like low case counts, low death counts, low fatality, and we should be 
living a normal life, allowing our economy to kind of progress again. Um, and we're still caught up in this kind of fear, fear, fear. Um, Pick cycle. a date. Let's just do this end on this. Pick a date when you think all four besties are vaccinated. I'm going to say April 1st. June. June. Okay. What do you got for your I say April 1st. We're all going to be vaccinated. It's literally a choice. I mean, any one of us could go get vaccinated in the next month. I mean, how? We're, none of us are over 30 BMI. I mean, Sachs was for a minute. California is opening 1B. A lot of the other states are opening broadly. If any of you wanted to get on a plane and go get vaccinated somewhere else, you could. I mean, there's enough places now that have open vax or will in the next 30 days, you can go get vaccinated. Okay, so, so you say 30 days, which would be March 15th or something. Yeah, th I think that's a choice for the four of us. If you guys want to hop on a plane, we can go get vaccinated. Does anybody have access to a plane? But sorry, <laughs> but doesn't that, con you're, you're, you're saying in an open vax state, Anybody can show up without proof of no, residency. you have to have a driver's license. I've looked into this. There have been different ways that this has played out. But generally speaking, there are market forces at play where, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Not saying that you're cutting line and screwing people over, but there are vaccinations that are happening all over the country now with people that want to get vaccinated. Uh, in, yeah. in, by the way, in California next week, tier 1B opens up. So anyone- but What does that mean? What is tier 1B? It's a total BS definition. It is absolutely ridiculous. I absolutely think this is the biggest waste of time and money ever. But tier 1B definition in California is healthcare, wor is, sorry, childcare workers. So anyone that's a teacher or works with children. I have kids. Uh, if your nanny or your daycare uh, people, um, you know, wanted to, they could go in and get vaccinated. Wait, oh, wait, our, our nanny can get vaccinated? Starting next oh, Wednesday my, in uh, California. Oh my, so, uh, and so all you need to do is go get to a vac site with vaccines. And, and by the way, they all, a lot of them have vaccination um, supply now, uh, or they will this weekend. There's apparently a big shipment going out. Um, and also all food and agriculture workers loosely defined. So people that work in grocery stores, restaurants, farm workers you're saying anyone if, chef, if, anyone, get... if you have a chef they can get vaccinated no no just, i think like, two people out of four on here might have chefs i think two of us definitely don't I'm so sorry so if you take care of your own kids and cook your own food you can't get vaccinated but if you do that for somebody else you can so wait you're saying if you have a chef and you have nannies you get vaccinated <laughs> no you don't That's you don't what i'm saying is is you yeah if you're a chef or a nanny for someone else you can go get vaccinated next week right but but david you, what do you want for dinner you, i'm coming over right now to make whatever you want <laughs> i'll watch your kids this weekend david get me a shot <laughs> it's so insane we have all these ridiculous job categories and distinctions it's just like with the lockdown policy they had 10 pages of exceptions for essential workers listen if you've got a policy with 10 pages of exceptions the policy, policy doesn't make any sense yeah like all the like, and this caused all the controversy in LA. Like anyone that works in the movie business is an essential worker, right. but people yeah. that Look, work, that people that work this. in restaurants and bars are not. Let's essential. see this for what it is. It is payoff to Newsom's political supporters. Uh, the, the the politicians Douche. are using. They use essential worker exceptions, and now they're using vaccines as political capital. They dole them out to their supporters so that you know, in exchange for you know votes down the road. Also the remember the exception, David, if you serve more than seven courses in your prefix, you can get a vaccine. <laughs> so that is the French laundry. If you add an amuse booze and an intermezzo, you qualify for the vaccine. Um, there are people going to states, renting houses, and getting driver's licenses, vaccine and getting tourism. vaccines. I know about yeah, it's this. called vaccine tourism. By the way, think right. about it this way. In six weeks, I think a lot of those restrictions are going to fall by the wayside because the supply is going to completely outstrip the nonsensical, you know, restrictions right. and prioritization methods we put in place. Yeah. And hopefully, God willing, these idiots who have the ability to vaccinate people open up their sites 24 seven and drop all the bullshit questionnaires and registration requirements, let people drive in, get a shot, wait 15 minutes and leave and have just some basic principled people on site that can take care of people if they have a, a adverse allergic reaction and get shots in arms. We have the shots, we have the supply, we're gonna be oversupplied by May. We are gonna have far more shots than there will be demand. And so, you know, we just need to get this this kind of nonsense thrown out the, right. the window. Straight to q &A. this is from uh, Videsh. He says, where are you investing your money over the next 10 years? So Friedberg, you want to start and then we'll go to Sachs and then uh, Mr. I've talked Pauly about Hapatia. this pretty largely, uh, you know, uh, on the podcast. I mean, two areas that are super interesting to me that um, I'm spending a lot of time on is obviously biomanufacturing. So the idea that we can kind of move away from traditional animal based agriculture and systems of production um, to systems where we use uh, genetically engineered 
uh, microbial organisms to produce molecules and materials and food, and that that uh, that system of production can have a radical impact on um, uh, on the environment, on the opportunity for jobs, on the cost of goods and uh, and things that humans want and consume. Um, and that's that's a primary area uh, of interest for me. And I think it's a multi decade. I think by twenty fifty, you know, we should see. Um, most of our goods that are manufactured rather than being made in the traditional sense, which is basically old technology scaled up, uh, which is what the industrial revolution did, uh, but really shift to a new model of manufacturing where we uh, use a smarter machine, which is a, a, gen a biologic organism to make stuff. So that, that's my interest. Sachs. Yeah, so I'm, I'm focused on the area of bottom up SaaS, which is basically business software that can go viral. Uh, very much in the mold of Yammer, which was a company I founded and sold back a, a dozen years ago. It was uh, the it's, precursor it's, to Slack, let's be honest. Right. It could yeah, have been $27 yeah. billion, but you did not <laughs> ride your winner. You took the quick billy, and that no, was I mean, look, not a mistake because it let you invest in the other 20 unicorns, correct? Kind of. I mean, so... So, so you, oh, you do so, have a chip on your shoulder about selling too early. Go no, ahead. no, Let it it's, out, not, it's, not, it's, it's not a chip. I, I would say that around the time that PayPal hit a $200 billion market cap and Slack had a $27 billion outcome, I started realizing, you know, if I just stuck with my ideas longer, you know, I probably would would do better. And I'm like, you know, I don't really need to come up with a new thesis or a new idea. I already came up with the idea 12 years ago, which is to make business software viral. I'm just going to keep investing in that thesis. So it's not that original or new for me, but mm. um, but but it is it, you know b bottom up has become the I would say almost the the dominant mode now of explain of, that of to SaaS. somebody who doesn't understand what you mean bottom up yeah so so bottom up means that the entry point for the software is any employee in the company they can just start using it they go to your website they start using it they spread it to their coworkers as opposed to top down top down is like the Oracle sales guy who carries a bag and goes to meet with the CIO. And, you know, sells them a big expensive implementation. That's the, and that's traditionally what business software used to be is a, is a big top down IT sale. Bottom up is, um, is just going in through the rank and file employees. All right. Chamath Palihapitiya, for the next 10 years, where are you putting your money? Uh, two areas. Uh, inequality. Well, I, it's not even 10. I would say for the next, for the rest of my life. Um, so it's, I think it, these arcs are multi decade, but, uh, inequality and climate change. And so, um, you know, the inequality side, what does that mean? It's any By the business. way, the second you said inequality and climate change, Sachs left. Uh, he went to throw up. Yeah, he was yeah, he, just he, like, what he, is he this went, nonsense? He, to up. Oh, he no, just no, no. read. He he's went to like, throw up. No, he's no, no, like, no. oh God, yeah, here yeah. we go. Oh, there, he's back now. He's okay. back. Sachs, did you throw up when Chamath said <laughs> inequality and climate change, climate change <laughs> out of your bag? No, when he I, said his woke <laughs> nonsense, did you just go throw up? <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I, I, I missed that. Virtue signal that you threw up. He had to polish yeah. his Glock. <laughs> <laughs> he just called the security he to, detail. He went, he went and he kissed his gold bricks <laughs> that he keeps in his house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, inequality basically means uh, anything that evens the starting line. So that if that's- Love it. Healthcare software that solves a chronic condition, or if that's financial software that drives inclusion, um, and then climate change is pretty obvious. But the the panoply of things that we need to do to basically, you know, slow the warming of the earth. Those are the two areas. Huge opportunity. Yeah. Huge. And uh, uh, for Vidash, if you even care, I take a remora like approach. Um, if you don't know what a remora is, you ever see like a big shark, and then there's like a bunch of things stuck to it. And it's like following the shark and it just eats whatever. So basically what I do is I'm getting behind these three guys and I just draft on these three sharks and just try to weasel my way onto their cap tables. It's a, it's a living, you know, basically it I works. just go to the poker game and try to No, uh, in all sincerity, I am stay, I am vertical agnostic because I think the great companies, um, make the verticals, they create the categories and the categories don't exist at, at your stage particularly. Yeah. What's that? At your in the stage, early stage. Particular, yeah, exactly. yeah, and so what I do in the early stage is I am focused on the process, and the process I'm trying to master here is what I do at thesyndicate.com, uh, which is find great companies and share it with now 7,000 accredited investors and let them decide you know, how much they want to invest in each deal. And just to give people an idea, we are on a $60 million run rate this year of deploy capital via the syndicate. In other words, it'll be four times, five times what my fund will do. The fund has access to 100% of deals, but the syndicate has access to 60% roughly. So now that we've broken our no advertising rule, yeah. 
No, I mean, I, we're all <laughs> talking our book here. Let's take another question. Um, and uh, Angel is available from uh, HarperCollins Business. Uh, <laughs> what? Oh, here's a good one. What's By the way, the if you want to save money on car insurance, MetroMile.com. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Also, the ticker symbol. Uh, what's the biggest investment venture miss you had early starting out that would have been a ridiculous return. What uh, is our anti-portfolio looking uh, like? Oh Friedberg, we'll start with you, then go Same Chamath, then go Sachs. Friedberg. Uh, I was with um, Jack oh, Dorsey. This is painful. In, um, in, uh, at this conference, and he went around and did a pass the hat on who wanted to invest in his new startup called Square. Oof. That's my story. What, what is that? A 50, is that a $50 million miss? Um. Yeah, I'm not going to say it, it, it would have been bad. You would have put you know. 50K in at 10 million. But I mean, the pro here's, by the way, an interesting thing, going back to the, the point Sachs made earlier and that we've said in the past, you know, when Square went public, there was a lot of questions and trepidation around its valuation. Big fund managers were poo pooing the company. And what's the market cap of Square today? Sachs, you might know. 100, 100, 120. 120 billion. Wow. I mean, 125 billion today. That's incredible, right? Because like when they went public, people were kind of poo-pooing it saying this thing is a this is a sub billion dollar company. You know, it shouldn't be worth anything more than a billion dollars and look at it just a few years later. Um anyway, yeah, I missed it. I missed that one on the uh, seed round and um and I've just watched with with awe at what Jack By the way, the, continued to, to innovate to, to build trough, that business. As a public company, it troughed at a four billion dollar valuation. It did, right? Um, it yeah. did like five years ago. And so within five years, it's gone from four billion to 124 billion. I, I was in a venture capital fund that invested in it. They distributed the shares. I sold half and I was like, I'll just keep half. I like Jack. I sold half at 72 and now it's at 276. And so ride your winners, folks. Uh, Sachs, anti portfolio, which one is the I most mean painful? Honestly, I haven't missed that much, just to be perfectly okay, frank. Okay, there you go. Um, Jesus Christ, but, unbelievable. Uh, what, a, <laughs> what a douche. <laughs> what a douche. What a fucking douche. <laughs> well, actually, okay, um, I'll, I I'll, I analyzed <laughs> my chess game with Peter Thiel, and uh, actually my check, my castle, uh, Queenside Castle, was actually a brilliant move uh, if he hadn't pinned my No, rock. I mean, look, I, uh, I, 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 I tend... Uh, I, I t look, I don't overthink these things too much. I mean, it's why I'm in like 27 unicorns. If the company looks good, I, I invest. Uh, is this Phil, you, is uh, Phil Helmuth here? <laughs> unbelievable. You have to have a Phil Helmuth. Well, you know, I got my 16th youth. ring. But uh, um, I've won 29 of the last no, 30 sessions. Is, no, what would you say your total like multiple is on all your angel investing? Like, do you have That's a sense not of what the that question, number is? Sachs. Answer the question. Come on. The audience asked what you missed. Can you just be humble enough to say yeah, you yeah, missed yeah. something? No, no, no. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So th th this was a sort of a semi-miss is that- um, <laughs> Oh is my that, God, it's not even a miss. This, am I no, no, no. Back well, here's in, how I made up for it. No, no, no. <laughs> I only in, put in half my normal amount. No, no, no. Let me tell you what happened. I did miss it. So uh, back in 2007, um, I thought Twitter was going to take off. I had a, like a former employee who wanted to sell secondary. And so, you know, I had a deal worked out to buy, I think, a couple hundred thousand dollars of shares at, I don't know, a $40 million valuation or something like that. And um, we submitted it to the company and then they rofered it. For because I think Chris Sock for Chris Saka basically I don't know if you remember Saka yep. had set up like some secondary secondary fund. thing yeah so yeah the, the fact that you know I wasn't able to complete that transaction probably cost me you know a couple hundred million bucks a Chamath anti portfolio what sticks well, out I have a I have a huge Airbnb anti portfolio huge Robinhood you know Airbnb at a billion obviously I actually did invest I agreed to invest but then I got into a huge public snafu with. With Chesky because he was taking a bunch of money off the table, and then we ended up not even finalizing the investment. And your letter um, was your letter was published. Your email was that leaked. You sent My email was leaked. Yeah, um, it was leaked. So I was really pissed when they did that. But anyways, that was a decade ago. Not much has changed, I guess. Um, there is one thing that above all others, um, which is sadly also in my portfolio. So my portfolio, my Andy portfolio, is the same thing. You can guess what it is, but that's Bitcoin. At one point. You know, we controlled low single digits, mid single digits of the entire float. And had I held on to that, that's talking about, you know, a mid deca billion dollar position. Yeesh. So my anti portfolio, uh, in, in the unrealized loss and unrealized gains or losses, if you will, on Bitcoin is in the many tens of billions of dollars. Yep. Mine is clearly Bitcoin as well, because I was reporting on it when it was 10 cents and I was one of the first journalists to write about it. 
uh, and talk about it on my podcast. And I had like maybe 10 of these Bitcoins in a wallet of um, that was uh, Mount Gox and it got hacked and it all went away. And then my wife bought it at under 200. And so now we have a joke in the house that my wife is going to because of her incredible trade because she she saw it as well um return more on her it's it's conceivable she'll return more than my entire investing career so shout out to jade uh for getting that one um actually i i made that mistake too that Jamoth made of of not hodling enough long enough so that that is that did is you guys painful. see did you see this article i i fished this article out but in 2014 i was buying uh, a, a land at martis camp in lake tahoe and I, I told the sales guy there, Jeff Hall, I said, hey, listen, I'll buy this lot if you let me buy it in Bitcoin because I wanted to promote Bitcoin Bitcoin as a transactional infrastructure. So we went to a company called BitPay. They wired it up and I bought it for $1.6 million in Bitcoin. That was 2,800 coins, which right now is oh. worth 140 or $150 million. What are you going to build on that lot? <laughs> Are you no, gonna put your I, I don't. I don't even own that lot. You should make it a grave. Anymore. You should make no. it a grave plot. You should just. <laughs> well, my my ex wife owns a lot. I hope. I hope she, you know she <laughs> enjoys it. But I'm saying, <laughs> you literally could have bought the bought. Knicks, Lakers, and the Warriors, and been the majority owner in each. All right, let's take another question. What's the number one macro uncertainty or risk you guys oh, are me, most worried me, about? For Let your investment portfolios. There, the there, there is only one, and I think it's inflation. But I think it's important to understand where inflation is coming from. The single biggest risk to all of us is what's going to happen in the following order of operations. So I think all of this sort of at the coming out of the pandemic, basically what you're going to have is like four or five major trading blocks in the world, right? You have China as a standalone. You have Europe as a standalone. You have America slash North America under Biden. I think it can be more North America as a as a standalone. And then you have these sort of what I would call random, you know, friends with benefits, Africa, South America, Japan, Korea. Okay. But those are all bit players to these three huge trading blocks. Everybody was going to go and they're going to go and get vertically integrated. So it sort of builds a little bit on what David said, like you're not going to have you know, one central place where you get this thing, basically, i.e. China, that you ship on a boat to get over here for a whole host of reasons, national security, carbon, etc. So you're going to have all these vertically, you know, vertically integrated supply chains and resilient economies. You know what that does when you have to try to build that stuff? Prices go screaming higher. Because instead of having one factory in China making 9 billion iPhone cases, you have now 50 factories all around the world, each with their own infrastructures and costs and whatever. And so I think you're going to reflate the world. Um, I don't know when it happens, but um, that's sort of the biggest risk to all of what we do is that all of a sudden, you know, real rates go to like six or 7%. And then all of a sudden, you're not going to look at a company trading at 50 times earnings and say, mm, you know, you're going to, you're going to question that. So that I think that's the biggest risk that I think. Friedberg, about. what's your risk? Sachs, what's your risk? Sachs, you go ahead. Yeah, so actually, m mine is pretty similar to Tomas, which is I think we're accruing these unpayable deficits and debts uh, and, and obligations, and uh, you know all this money has to be paid back at some point uh, that the, that the U.S. government's incurring. I mean, there's a California version of this where we've accrued a trillion dollars of pension obligations that we have no ability to pay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that eventually it translates into inflation, but I think it translates into something even worse, which is at some point people become skeptical about loaning money to the U.S. government and the, 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 because they don't want the U.S. to be able to just print dollars to pay back these, these loans. And uh, the U.S. dollar stops becoming the world's reserve currency. I think the reason why we're seeing Bitcoin go to the moon right now is people are starting to speculate on the idea that, that this might be the future world reserve currency because it's not subject to manipulation by by you know um by central banks and uh and and, and you know and, and let's think like that that world looks if you think about like a world in which the the u.s dollar is not the world's reserve of currency anymore in which the government is basically uh broke i mean that is it's it's pretty scary to think about there's a ray dalio who's a um a famous uh, and, you know, prominent uh, hedge fund founder uh, of Bridgewater Associates wrote an essay 
uh, if anyone's interested, called The Big Cycle of Money, Credit, Debt, and Economic Activity. You can find it online. He published it last year. Highly recommended reading. He has a few chapters that that proceed and follow um, that talks about the grand macroeconomic cycle of, of governments and societies. And it's really worth the read. Um, I think one really basic principled economic point is that governments operate in such a way that their um, their people ask for goods and ask for services. Um, the government spends on those services by borrowing more than they're making in income in that year, um, and and that is, I think, the uh, you know the premise for a lot of how governments operate around the world. Um, the only way that that works over time is if your future shows that that borrowing allows you to grow your revenue more. And therefore, you can underwrite taking on debt to pay in the future. So you, you force growth. And, you know, I've said this a couple of times before, but it is the most basic principle, but it is also the most scary and shocking principle, which is the only way you can afford debt is if you have growth. And that forces you to find growth. And when you're forced to find growth, you get all of these unnatural perturbations in terms of economic activity and market forces. It is not necessarily the case that things should and would always grow. And we force mm. things to always grow because of the mechanism by which we fund our <clears throat> services at a government level. Um, and that is what's basically going to ultimately lead um, to a lot of different types of crises, both kind of financial crises, but, uh, uh, but also um, right. societal crises in terms of, you know, revolution and, and, and social pushes for socialism and, uh, and all the other things that, that are typically associated with things like inflation. Um, and so it, it is it is the big crisis of the, the 21st century will be, you know, we underwrote growth in the 20th century. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, forces that uh, that may kind of, you know, bring that all to, to kind of bear uh, this century. I see one that's maybe a little less acute and a little bit more big picture, which is the number of people living in democracies in the world as a percentage of population, which has been going down, uh, which if you asked anybody, they would be pretty shocked to hear. But just looking at the percentage of humans on the planet, not the percentage of countries, because the percentage of countries that are democracies or, you know, flawed democracies um, is right now at, um, you know, 45%. And we have 55% of regimes are authoritarian or hybrid. And the population of people living in those is growing. So we, we have countries that are authoritarian that are growing countries that are democracies like in Europe or, or in the West and the US, Canada are declining in, or not keeping up pace in terms of population growth. And that is, a, I think, going to be the, the major issue, which is does China win capitalism plus authoritarianism? Or does democracy plus capitalism work? The next question I think is super fascinating, uh, which is what would each of you wish you could teach every 12 year old right now? What a great question. Chamath, uh, you want to go first? Do you have something that comes to mind? or you need a minute to think about it? Wow, it's such a fabulous question. I it's mean, a great question. There's, very, there's, so, there's so very many answers. Very personal for all of us. Yeah. There's so many answers there. Um, well, let's let's workshop it. Anybody well, just well, have just, a thought? Just, what this, comes this, to mind? This is very this is very tactical. Okay, so I'm yeah. sure there's like grander things, but just the two things we're not really teaching are coding and financial literacy. Hmm. Those are like the two big, I think, omissions in the curriculum right now, and would be very helpful for for people to learn. Oh, I mean, on that theme, I would also then add, um, like better eating habits, um, and, uh, mental health exercises. Mm. Freeberg, you got any that come to mind? Things you want your 12 year old or everybody's 12 year old to learn? I think the principles of uh, biology and how we, I, I mean, again, like, I feel like we underestimate and we don't talk enough about the opportunity and the reality that is about to hit us like a tidal wave of uh, bioengineering. Um, you know, everything in medicine is moving towards this notion of using biological machines to fix our bodies, like not just a molecule, which is the historical way of doing medicine, where you find a molecule it does something in the body, you stick it in, you turn it into a drug. But we are actually on the precipice of creating machines, biologically engineered or designed cells and proteins that can go into your body and do specific things and enhance your your life and improve your health and solve, you know, disease. Similarly, like I talked about earlier, biomanufacturing to make all the materials and food uh, in a more sustainable way and a lower cost way. And so I think teaching the principles of DNA, how DNA causes protein, how co protein causes function, 
uh, and how cells operate um, and, and how that is basically being softwareized. Um, and you can basically think about biology now as being software. Uh, I think that is the, the trend of, of, um, of science and engineering. I think computing created a great foundation, but I, I think that's really, if I were to tell my 12 year old uh, daughter in eight years what she should consider doing um, or spending her time studying, it's bioengineering and, and what the opportunities are that are gonna arise from that. Uh, all, all great answers. I think for me, I'll, I'll again, move it up a level since you guys took some of my answers. Uh, uh, financial literacy was definitely going to be uh, in there for me. Um, but I would say radical self reliance, um, and entrepreneurialism and resiliency. I think a lot of young people right now don't believe that they have agency in their lives, in the world that they can create stuff that they can not be stopped if they go and do something. And they there's a victim uh, mentality and culture that the system is rigged against you and that you cannot rise above, which I understand why people feel that way. But I actually think it's less true than ever. And so we have to basically really remind people that if you are radically self reliant, you can live the American dream, you can create anything you want, there is absolutely nobody who can stop you. And, you know, all the knowledge you want to learn is out there. And so, so the in radical self reliance for me, is this concept of the ability to learn and the ability to learn how to learn and having faith that you can learn any skill, you know, even 60, 70%, you know, uh, very quickly is what I see um, results in, you know, people being successful in life, this ability to take on any new topic with a zeal uh, and an understanding that you can master it or, or even 60 or 70% mastery means something going around the horn. We're going to plan a, a bestie trip. And we might even allow besties to come for the first live bestie show. What is your vote? I want everybody to type it into the chat room. I Everybody's going to type in where they most want to have a, a bestie show. All right, I like it. Okay, so Chamath and I both want to go to New York. Sax wants to go to Miami to see Keith Raboy and Peter Thiel, his besties. Those are his alternate universe besties, by the way. They won't do a podcast together. No. Oh my God, how great would that podcast be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that would be I, I think you call that the righties the righties you know, you've got the besties you've got the leasties and you're gonna get the right yeah, I'm starting the leasties it's gonna be me Howard Lindzen Sarah Cohn <laughs> and uh, Prof, Prof G Prof G now by wh the why, why wouldn't you call it the worsties I the mean, worsties be the worst yeah I'm gonna the do the worsties just as a thing I had an idea here's an idea if we want to be the number one podcast Friedberg, do you have any of that Molly from your 1999 2000 era? Uh, I've never, I've rave? never done Molly. I've never done okay, Molly. Okay, sure. You just yeah. made your own synthesis of it and took it. Okay, great. Here's how you we know, become the number one podcast. We all <laughs> take Molly at the start of the podcast, and we start the podcast 30 minutes in, and then we see if David Sachs can say, "I love you." <laughs> <laughs> can I just say we've done more self-referential navel gazing bullshit on this pod than any other pod, and I don't know. This is like even worse than you don't have to listen to it, people. We may need this to is spike. worse than Vlad. Nick will need to edit the fuck out of this and spike it. <laughs> spike it. All, All right, right, boys. Here we love All you. All right, boys. I love you, besties. Love you, David. Gotcha. Love you, I other gotcha. David. I got gotcha. you. Gotcha. Love you, Chamath Palapatia. We upgraded the Davids, by the way, with their outrage and cantankerous firmware, which we saw from Friedberg when he threatened to quit the podcast over the publishing of the Robin Hood. No, that's why we added the thirst trap uh, feature set. That's why he went to throbbing <laughs> and pulsating. <laughs> he was throbbing and pulsating. We'll see yeah, you all next gotta, time on the All In Pod. And it said we open source it to the fans and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West Ice Queen of Kinwa. Wait, <laughs> <What? laughs> <laughs> 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 did you get merch? I'm going on.